Boom. Live. We're live. What's up, guys? This is Keith Kelfus with the Untrapped Podcast. Yes. Right now we have an awesome guest. We have Sid Graff. And you're in Montana right now, bro. You got a fully automated business and you have employees out working. You have your whole business is systematized to the point where you only work a few hours a week in your business and it it didn't come easy you've paid your dues you put in your time all the way to the point where now you're a coach and you've coached uh, i don't know if hundreds if not thousands of other businesses you've even coached me in my business and dude i'm so incredibly thankful so dude we met in 2016 at the huge convention for the first time we've been friends ever since and dude you're just you got you got on a headset right now you said you couldn't make it back to the studio in times so you're out on the town and wi-fi what's going on sid So good oh, yeah. to see you, Keith. I, I can say I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. I mean, probably since we scheduled. I'm like, this is cool. I get to hang out with you and and have a little banter and have a conversation. But hopefully, here's some wisdom and some uh, enough awesome enough to start their own business, to step out on their own and have that courage to like make their mark on the world. I think that's a fantastic thing when anybody is willing to do that. I love it, bro. So, and you also posted recently I also, on Facebook, man. It was like very. I'm in rural Montana. If if you can hear yeah. me, and Keith can't. I'm in rural Montana. I got stuck down here. There we go. Thank you, Brooke. Keep going. Go ahead. Oh, I saw. I saw on Facebook you posted a picture of like go. you and your wife have been together for like so long. How many years is it again? Like it was just like this definition of 30, success. Thirty to years. You. That's amazing. Thirty years, bro. All right, so um, oh, Mr. Tidy Garden said I listened to sit on Josh Latimer's Vault podcast. Yes, he's the dude. Hopefully, you can hear this when I say I apologize for having shit Wi-Fi and having a choppy show. Yes, I really been looking forward to this. Can you hear me now? My back oh, end. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I think I heard you say. You've been married for 30 years. What's the definition of success for you? Yeah. Talk about that. And then talk about what uh, this in the podcast, growth strategy and persistence. Yeah. Growth strategy and persistence. So um, I'm one of the, the owners and, and the facilitator of a mastermind called the AMP Mastermind. Amplify your business. And one of our core values is progress, not perfection. And a lot of time, I mean, not a lot of time, all the time, it's always easy to get caught up in looking at, you know, the, the stuff that people put on media, you're looking at everybody else and you think, oh my God, they're up here. They're so amazing. And you're, you know, you have these, these really aspirational goals and things. You look at people that are like, I look at a guy like uh, uh, the, the garage door guy. He's, you know, 200 million. Oh, Tommy, Tommy Mello. Mello. You know what I'm talking about, right? And, and I go, oh my God, like I'm such a loser. I'm a beginner when I look at stuff like that. But we always have to recognize that our goal is progress, not perfection. Like all the time when you're looking at how far you have to go, it's it's so important to turn around and look behind you and go, how far have we come? So I want to give you a context for that. So that I've been married for 30 years. I'm surprised that I lasted for 30 days because that was, you know, I didn't think that when I was a kid, I didn't think marriage is for me. And, that, you know, I found a person that uh, my my wife who like I could share my soul with and we've been together 30 years people go how do you do that and I'm like today I'll do it today and I'm going to keep doing it just one day at a time I never planned 30 years down the road same thing with business hey I get to funny um, humble beginning story Keith when I first started cleaning windows 1993 in Clearwater Florida and I just needed to pay rent. I was not interested in starting a window cleaning business. I was trying to get a job, but my next door neighbor cleaned windows and I'm like, hey Jude, can I like ride with you for a day and see what you do? And he's like, yeah, come on. So like my goal is two weeks, I gotta pay $400 rent. And I just started. And then I was like, oh, this is pretty fun. And then I kept going. And then I was like, oh, this is actually really cool. And I kept going. The first year in business, first year, we reported $9,000 of revenue, revenue, not profit, revenue. Now I didn't have any overhead. I had a bucket and a squeegee, right? 
but this is, I'm going to get somewhere with this. Year three, my tax return showed $54,000 of revenue. And I thought, oh my God, I'm rich. I really I thought, because I'd never seen or heard of that much money in my life. Um, this week, today is May 1st. Our, our combined company's revenue is $58,000 for the week, not for a year. And it's, but like, it didn't happen like that. It happened progress, 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 a little at a time. And a lot of, you know, a lot of learning, a lot of stumbling, a lot of finding people to coach and help until we got to a point where we're like, oh, that, you know, now it feels substantial. Once again, I feel like, oh, I'm, I feel like I'm king of the world. We, you know, we're doing 200 grand this month where the reality is, you know, five years from now, I'll look back and go, really, that was all? You were such a beginner. You, you're always growing, but it's always important to look back and see how far you've come rather than being frustrated by how far you have to go. Because like you, Keith, you have some lofty goals. You got some great goals and you're on a, a path and a trajectory to just kick ass all over the place in your, in your, in your career. So you know, there gotta be times when you're looking ahead going, man, I don't know if I can ever get there. You're just so frustrated. You wanna be there and not here. You know what I mean? I know a hundred percent. I get so pissed off. This, I pace we're both around the a block lot? Or okay. at night before I can go to bed. And I just, I pray. And I also, I just like these feelings that don't produce results. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. Rah, rah, rah. It's this, a, this frustrating feeling of it not happening fast enough and obsession with personal development. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that we, we share that obsession. Um, the thing that I'm, that is like right keyed in the center of my mind right now. And this actually started right about the time you and I had a coaching call um, is the concept of just inertia. Like most people are following whatever path they're on, not because they selected a path, but because they just happen to start going down a road and then you build up a little momentum. And then you're like, well, I just got to go down this road. So it's like if I accidentally started window cleaning, what if we made 100,000? And then it was just a bigger goal. But I honestly never questioned, is this what I want to be doing? Because it was really, it was good. And it was, is enjoyable, right? And we were making money, like the financial part is like, okay, we got this down. I have a good life. But the only, it's inertia. I'm going down this road. And the only thing I'm thinking about is how hard do I press the gas? Not, should I be on this road in the first place? Now I'm, a, I'm happy with the path, right? But when it, like we live in a day and time that it's easier than ever to diverge, to do like, you can change, you can reinvent yourself. You can like fast, fast. You, can, you just change your social media profiles, change your, your languaging, change your title and start networking with that title and people perceive you differently almost immediately. Now your inner circle will go, what the, what the hell are you doing? But if you go like my true path is, you know, fill in the blank. Like if you say, I've been cleaning windows for 20 years, but I really want to be a performing musician, a singer songwriter. I'm going to learn to play guitar. Like, is there anything stopping you? Yes. No. Yes. There's, there's there nothing, right? <laughs> And you get, oh, well, there is, right? There, there is, there's, there's plenty <laughs> behind the scenes. There's your own emotional baggage or, or things like that. But uh, I was talking about specifically, you know, if you get two hands, you can learn to play guitar. <laughs> okay. The singer part, maybe. No, I was thinking about it's hey, a I, professional I do musicians say it again. have a hard road it, because in a service business, you got all these people that want services done and it's all about them. And then the musician, I'm sorry, I'm getting off pitch. The musician's all about the musician. Hmm. So the mu musician has a longer road to monetize. That's what I was saying. You got to get really, anyways, I'll okay. shut the hell up. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. But it, it's like you, you and I, I mean, you can like, you've got, you've got the, uh, the landscape, you've got the window cleaning, but you also have a media company. And I do know your passion for media and for helping people through video, through, you know, podcasting, through public speaking. I mean, and you've got a bigger vision from that that I don't know if you've shared with your audience, but it's like, it's pretty 
immense. And you're one of the very few people that I know that has gone, hey, I can, I don't have to go down this road. I can shift and go over here and like pick a road and, and go down it. Now you're doing a pretty adept job at running parallel tracks. We're doing both. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> His eyes went sideways. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I came to terms that I realized something, uh, hopefully this will be helpful about my, if myself, if we're talking about me for the moment, is I like that feeling of having so much shit going on that I'm right at the brink of overwhelm or, or, or <laughs> losing my shit. And that's actually my comfort zone because when I don't have that much stuff going on, I fall like right into like some like a depression i have to have a whole bunch of things going on and it's this addiction mm -hmm. to inertia or momentum it's actually probably not a good thing i don't know it's it's good that you recognize it like if you've you know if you've got a zone that's your productivity zone meaning like when i i, I tell my my wife like i would be a, if i were in the military i'd be a really great field commander because i can assess a situation and go here 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 act to go go and give direction and do things in the moment at this like live in real time i'm really good at that but when it's time to like you know now with with the three different businesses like i have to zoom way back and spend a lot of time on strategy and preparation and collaborative thinking and it's difficult for me and it, it's a lot easier for me when i start doing that to just get up and go outside and go for a walk or Go play with the dog or do something else but when you know like when everybody's shooting at you like i'm good at dodging bullets and and uh, directing the flow of traffic so it's interesting it's a skill oh that's fascinating what you said right there oh okay i just had a great example but i'd rather hear you keep talking <laughs> all right well cool well um there's there's some cool stuff going on in the world right now, and I think most of your most of the people that that follow you can kind of relate because we're all kind of cut from the same cloth. You're like, I want to do my own thing, I want to build my own, you know, I want to build it. I don't want to just work for somebody else. I, like I have to carve out my space in this world and see if I can, you know, if I can do it. That's good. That's brave. That's courageous. It's admirable. At the same time, you're probably like a lot of us in the entrepreneurial space are probably pretty damned ADD and you're interested not in one thing or two, you're interested in 50. And while that's good also, it, it also can be your Achilles heel. You know, so I'm always working with the three businesses we have, two that are on the periphery. And then what's the latest, newest, cool thing? Like, you know, it, I'm, I'm working on uh, a program right now for using AI in small business. Like, how do we use artificial intelligence effectively in small business? Everybody by now, not everybody, but most people have heard of ChatGPT and you've probably been playing with it. And I'm fascinated, but I'm more interested in what can we do with it and how can we teach people how to use it effectively to be the leader of the pack? Because even though, like, if you're, you know, if when you're into something, that's all you see online. So I think, oh my God, everybody's heard of ChatGPT and we're way behind the curve. Reality is you're in the like one one hundredth of a percent of people in the country if you've even logged into ChatGPT. So you're way ahead, right? But that's what I'm fascinated with right now. So we're like, I've got my, thankfully, I, as you mentioned in the introduction, I've got good teams, we have good systems. Um, it's not all rosy, they're, they're tough days, you know, but they're most of the day-to-day happens without me and then it leaves me free in my head and with time to dig into other cool and interesting shit. Mm. So you've got proven and you got experimental. What percentage of you so your time is freed up and make sure yeah. that the proven stuff is working well and what percentage of you dives into experimental new ventures? Okay. Percentage wise, first of all, with the with the proven stuff and having it, you know, kind of on autopilot, my experience has been that you get it on autopilot and you think, hey, this is just going to run on its own. But it generally it's like, you know, maintenance on your car. It You can't ignore your car forever. You got to get tune ups. You got to put gas in it. You have to do, you know, like it's designed as a unit to operate, but you still have to maintain it. And I find that with 
each of my three businesses, they still require a reasonable amount of time. So I'd say half of my waking business hours are spent attending to the three businesses. Yes. It's me half. Thirds of that time is spent on like trying to get a 10,000 strategy and see it from up here. And then I have that 10 to 15% of my overall business time that is just exploration. It was like, here's this new thing and I'm going to learn how to use it. Like I got to like, it is AI tools right now. Like I'm, I'm learning how to, the, the chat GPT, let's just call it Chad. Cause I hate saying chat GPT, but Chad, my AI friend is, uh, is pretty easy to work with. If you understand prompts and you understand that it will retain and remember a conversation you can layer on top of a conversation you've already started within chat. Uh, but there's like, that's just, a, that's a just scratch in the surface because you've got, you know, um, AI, AI is like Flicky, which can take your audio and build you a voice avatar and clone you and clone your voice. So you can, now you can write scripts and just feed it into Flicky and produce full podcast episodes that are automated, sound exactly like you, but it's not you. It's just your AI avatar, if you will. There's also, um, well, there's like a zillion AI tools. Now you can do the same thing. You can make your video avatar. You can c convert your videos. I, I usually like to find a person that's good at something and utilize them. But for some of the AI tools, since it's also new, um, I'm digging in with my own fingers and getting dirty with Chad with Descript for video editing. Uh, so you can take a single video and edit it 20 different ways, or you can pro edit it for different platforms. Just there's so much stuff that's fascinating right now that uh, it's kind of mind bending. So I want to give you an example, like or an analogy. Not with when uh, when automobiles came out, and you know, like we started seeing a lot of production in the 1920s. <clears throat> I said we saw none of us alive saw automobiles coming out in the 1920s. But when when that was the new technology, there were hundreds of manufacturers building automobiles, and that over time. And I'm sorry for all the background noise. Over time that winnowed down through mergers, acquisitions, you know, weaker ones dying off and stuff. So you had in Detroit, you get the big three, right? And, and now, you know, there's probably like 10 primary automotive manufacturers for the every for every man. But it took a while for that to happen. So that'll happen with, it happened with cellular carries, it happened with internet browsers, it happened with search engines until you get the clear leaders. And that'll happen with the AI space as well. But here's the thing, like, most people, when cars came out, if they were interested in cars at all, their goal was, I want to get one. I want to get a car and drive it. That's fascinating on its own, and it was cutting edge and innovating. But what I'm interested in, if this were the day of cars, like, I don't want to just buy a car to drive it. I want to know what can be done with this car. I want to invent auto racing or... figure out some of the the auxiliary industries that will be built up around, like for automobiles, automobile brought us the internet, the uh, interstate highway system. It brought all fast food. There would no, not be a McDonald's franchise if it weren't for the automobile, because the drive-through happened. Like these were all like incredibly innovative last century. Well, same thing happens like moving forward. Every new technology, when it comes out, it's designed to do this. And then really smart people go, oh, it'll do this, 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 and this. And they get crazy with it. And they they build on top of it as a platform. So I'm interested in, like, what else can it do? I want to be a dealer that sells automobiles or the guy that says, you know what? We can build fast food restaurants around the country because now everybody's got automobile. So I want to be in the industry and not just own the technology and use it personally, but either teach others how to use it or find those adaptive uses for it to help move businesses forward. My, my lane is small business. So that was a bit rambling, uh, but it's freaking exciting. 
really exciting. Yes. It's, you know, you, depending it, just like uh, when cryptocurrency came out and you're like, yeah, people, they're either. Is, I'm really not in a great spot for a live stream. Uh, anyway, when crypto came out, you know, people's like, crypto is going to change the world. Bitcoin's going to be a million dollars. And you had other people was like, this is the most worthless thing in the world. Well, people said the same thing about the internet. They're like, it's a fad. In 1997, it's a fad. It'll be gone in 10 years. Internet changed the way not only our country, but our lives to so the world operates. Crypto and blockchain and DeFi is doing a similar thing. Some of the people that I listen to are talking about the AI movement being bigger than the internet as far as a change in the structure of society and how things happen. Mm. You go, will it be? I don't know. I mean, you got to make your bets. But I'm inclined to think with the ease of use and interface with AI that, yeah, this could be bigger than the internet as far as opportunities it develops, you know, what you can get done. Like it, it's difficult to make a case that it's important to have a, a broad knowledge of things in the world because now everything's at your fingertip in conversational style. Like the cues and prompts that you can use with Chad are conversational. It's not coding language. It's not, you don't have to be super specific. It can ferret out and, and uh, synthesize what you're asking and give you good answers. There's now, there's a plugin for Chrome that you can use that allows uh, Chad only operates or has access to anything published before 2021. <clears throat> so it's been published in the last two years is not in the resource file, but you can add a, an extension to your Chrome browser that allows Chad to access all its normal shit and access everything about it online. And that like, how long has Google been the 800 pound gorilla in the world for search engine? Like right. It started in 1998. So it's 25 years old now. And by 2006, Google owned 90% of search and it's never been less than that. Right. But since November, whatever, 15th, since chat GPT was released, it's the first time there was a viable threat to Google's dominance just on this platform and it's not even a search engine it's it's a fascinating time okay how's that for a rabbit hole keith you know what it's like let's run down Absolutely. rabbit holes together you're reminding me of a book i recently read by kind of stuff, Wagon called opportunity where he talks about emergent property yeah. so he said it take you know it took a hundred years for well thousands of years for the since the industrial revolution to the information age in you know 100 years and they finally created the internet and took the internet 25 years to get to the point where it was that level of like mastery where internet was mainstream everything and everything had been developed on top of it then this other industry yeah. that could not have existed without the internet mobile devices and apps apps started out like i don't know what 15 years ago and it took forever for apps to finally get to the point where now apps were like mastery they're being created all over the place and then the taxi cab industry took like a hundred years to you know get to the point where it's everywhere and it's a full industry well none of those industries well some geniuses got together and created uber right but uber imagine these emergent prop it creates this emergent property like i think of like a pyramid like you put these things together then it shoots up to the sky because i see everything symbolically not verbally yeah, yeah. so it, without any of those industries growing to a level 10 on their own completely independently when you put those three industries together google inter, uh, i mean internet apps and the taxi industry now you got uber so what's happening is it's like a bell curve or a hockey stick things are going straight up and it's creating what's called emergent properties which is hence the word opportunity so things that you couldn't even imagine or even pontificate or wrap your your head around are now going to be happening people are like things couldn't get more sophisticated than this but what you're saying is ai going to be changed in the way of life people don't see it and so it sounds like you're trying to lean into the curve and lean into the to be the the like 
the tip of the spear and you want to be hyper aware of this shit because you can learn more, do more, be more, have more and capitalize off of it and also implement it in your businesses and help other people around you. So this is like a massive opportunity and you're raising the necessity so people can fucking see it. Like, can you see this? This is amazing. I could tell by your passion and the way that you codify, quantify and basically articulate it is that like you're on fire about this shit, but because you have a systematized business and you've done the work, put the work in to make your, your main streams of income, you know, pay all your bills and take care of your employees. Now you've been able to free up your time to actually lean into the experimental stuff based what I asked you, you know, 15 minutes ago, proven versus experimental. But first you got to have like the systems and strategies and get your business locked down. Yeah. Unless you would just want to be all over the place, but it sounds like you're a really focused well, you are a very focused guy, and it's like I'm just taking notes, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's true. It, I mean, the, the focus is critical to get you anywhere. It's just like you know, light being focused into a laser. It's much more effective the more focus you have. It's got more power, right? And uh, I, I get to say, years and years ago, there was uh, I forget who did it. it was some marketer I was paying attention to. It's probably Jay Abraham. And this is when when Yellow Pages was a thing. So 20 years ago, and he's like take the yellow pages and open it to any business category, say plumbers. And he said, you read the ads and you can do the same thing online. You know, like you just search plumbers in my area and read their ads. What they state is like, like their unique selling proposition, their USP, <clears throat> all of them, all of them, except maybe one in a market will say, we have the best prices or we have the best service or we have the best quality or some version of those three quality service prices. And it's all they talk about. And they're literally interchangeable. You could go, you could go Bob's plumbing and take his name and stick it on Tony's plumbing and it, like it fits. It's the same. There's nothing separating them from anything else. But I recall seeing an ad when I was skimming through and uh, this company said, we specialize in everything. And I'm like, how you can't, you can't specialize in everything. You can maybe specialize in two three things at the most. If you're going to be a specialist, it should be one, right? So that's the laser. Like that's why, you know, why uh, surgeons get paid more than an MD, right? But if you're, you're like a surgeon, if you get really specialized, you go, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. So I'm handling all these joints. It's, you know, it's your, your rotator cuff and a knee replacement and hips. But if you get really specific and you go, I only do knees. Now you're like, this guy's making way more and working less and he's super focused or, you know, a heart surgeon that only does angioplasty or only does, you know, like a certain thing. It's like the more laser focus you get, usually the bigger results you get, but it, it's just like super niching, right? You like pick a narrow, narrow niche and go an inch wide and a mile deep. That's probably more financially rewarding than any other way you can play it, but almost nobody does it. Because I want to be all things to all men. When people say, hey, Sid, do you guys, do your company do this? I want to say, yeah, we can do that for you. Because I like to please people, right? I go, yeah, we can do that. Yes, yes, yes. We have to learn how to say, no, that's not our, that's not my lane. Like we're not, yes, we could do it, but we're not going to be the best choice for that. Like we're really good at this one thing or these three things. Like just right here, that's our sweet spot. Somebody else can have all the rest. So like you, we did talk just a little bit earlier I want to touch on a couple of like business strategy, not just for growth, but for profit and peace of mind, like simple stuff that it doesn't matter what level of business you're on. If you are one guy with a trailer and you're out landscaping or you're, you've got like, it's you and a helper, or if you have five teams out there busting ass for you and, and you've got somebody running the office, it doesn't matter the level of business, probably the number one thing that anyone can do to increase their bottom line and to simplify their business is just evaluate your customers and go like you, the 80, 20 principle, you do an 80, 20 analysis on your customers and say, who are my best customers who pay me the most money and we have the, the least friction. Like, cause we've all had customers that they don't pay you much and they're paying the ass. You've had customers that pay you a lot and they're still paying the ass. You've had others that pay you a lot and they're always happy you're there. And all they do is like, they just give you a check or they just, you know, hey, here's my credit card number. They're happy to work with. If you analyze your customers, you don't even have to go very deep. It just go, just raise your prices. Like if 
yeah, I lack the courage to do this for years. But if you just go, hey, we're raising our prices 25%, and I need to let you know this is what's going to happen in 90 days. We got a price increase. Everybody knows inflation's biting you in the butt. I get it. But we want to stay in business for a long time. We want to serve you really well, Keith, for the rest of history. But in order to do that, we do have to raise our price this much. And we're not just going to like we're not just going to jack it and stick it to you. We're going to continue to provide this great value. We have to raise our prices because we have to pay people in this competitive market enough for them to stay because you want people that you trust. <laughs> to home. So I literally sent out an email Sorry. to our entire customer base um, just before April. And I said, good news. We're raising our prices. And I stole that from somebody else. They said, good news. We're raising prices. And here's why. And here's why it's important. Here's what will happen. If you've got a reasonable base of clients, you will lose some clients. Let's just say it's 10%. The 10% that you lose are not usually your best customers or your highest paying customers. They're usually the people that are toward the bottom. And we, we like for our window cleaning company, we've had a $200 minimum for a couple of years. And we said, hey, we have a $300 minimum. And we're raising our prices 25%. And we gave them one opportunity to book in a two week period at their old price. And after that, your new price is up here. And we we pissed off a couple of people. We had a handful of people email back and go, that's cool you're doing that. We want you to be around. I'm like, this is awesome. I mean, we had we saw our costs go up last year in some categories, much as you know, 50%. Our, our uh, payroll went up 50%. So, the, but the 25% price increase, most of that goes to the bottom line ultimately, right? That's like our margin is 20%. So we added 25%. Almost all of that goes to the bottom line. So we'll probably double our profit this year because of it. The pe people that said, nope, I'm not paying 300, were people that were only paying 200 in the first place. They didn't want to go higher. I'm like, great. You know what it's like to send a team across town to do a $200 job? It's it's hard to even break even. Like you're, you're frustrated if you're the one driving. You're like, oh, Jesus Christ, I'm going all the way. Oh, my God. I can't believe I'm going to go pull weeds at Martha Johnson's house for two hours. You're making two hundred dollars, dude. I know, but there's forty five minutes of traffic this way and that way, and I could have gotten a thousand dollar job, but instead I'm doing two hundred. So a lot of those just go away on their own, and you can focus on let's get the higher paying customers that are more profit margin. Here's what happens when you're charging more for a job: is you're not trying to figure out how can I. I, I don't want to say cut corners. But people cut corners to try to make their profit, right? You're like, you're rushing or you're doing something. You're like, okay, I didn't, you know, you're, you're just trying to hustle to make sure you make your money. But if you raise your price, it's like you can slow down a little bit and pay extra attention to detail and make that customer feel like, like you treat them like they're the rock star. And they're, they're like, oh my God, this level of service, nobody's doing this. Like, this is beautiful. People that that want real quality, like want real value, they're willing to pay. But now I said I would mention strategy. So that's really a tactic. Raise your price. You'll increase your bottom line. You'll get rid of a lot of your pain in the ass customers. We call them PETAs and we all have them. And once in a while we fire them on purpose, but a lot of time we just let them self-select out by like, just increase your price. And a lot of them just go, yeah, I'm out of the game. I can't, I can't ante up. And you're like, okay, that's fine. It's not, no offense. It's just the game we're playing now. Right. If you put this on a strategic level, they go raise your price. The, the thing that pricing strategy is like an, an almost untalked about um, foundational element of your business. And you think about it like this. Think about Walmart and Nordstrom's. Walmart is the low price leader. When we were broke as a joke, Keith, we shopped at Walmart for groceries because they could get like the mac and cheese for 29 cents a box or something like that. And I don't shop there anymore. I never enjoyed it, but it served its purpose. I need to save every nickel. Now we shop at Whole Foods Market and you pay, you know, like it's $4 a box for mac and cheese. And it's not you know, like, why am I doing this? I don't know. I like the experience more. I do like to eat organic and healthy when I can. But if you get Walmart and Nordstrom's, you can go buy a shirt at Walmart. And you get it for four bucks. You can go get a nice shirt at Nordstrom's and pay $140 for a 
But if you haven't done it, anybody that's watching or listening, like later on, go to Nordstrom sometime. Don't even go like you're going to buy something, but just go, walk in. I'm a man. I go into the men's department. I go, hey, I'm really interested in a Hugo Boss suit. Can you show me a few? And the, the service is like, bam, because like, Yes, sir. Nice to see you. What's your name? Mr. Graff. I'm really glad you're here. Come with me. What size are you? You look like you're about a 40. We're going to take some measurements. Is that okay? And they're like, boop, boop, boop. walk into Walmart and say, I need help finding a shirt. They're like, shirts over there. If you even get somebody to help you. And it's not putting them down. It's like, you're. there's a difference. So pricing strategy. Are you in your business going to be the low cost leader? Are you going to go... We'll do, we'll do carpets. We'll, I don't care. Any size house, 99 bucks. We'll just do it. Like you can get a lot of business that way. You can stay busy all the time and you can be busy every single hour of the day and still lose money by being the low cost leader. Because normally an individual operator doesn't have, like you don't have the capacity to operate at scale that's required to do a low price because business is about margin. Like if it costs you $100 to provide this service and you charge $101, that's 1% margin. If you're doing a billion dollars a month, you can be very profitable on 1% margin because that's 10 million a month profit. But if you're like you and I, and I go, I've got a $100 job, I need to charge 200. So I've got a $100 margin because I can't do a billion dollars this month. I can do 50,000, I can do 10,000, whatever it is. It's like. You have to have margin. Yeah. So you can be the Walmart of the world, or you can attempt it, but you probably can't manage it. I mean, it's just a different game where you can be a specialist and provide a higher level of service and charge a higher price, and you can be the Nordstrom's. Because if you're selling a you know $5,000 suit and you make you know $2,500 every time you sell one, you don't have to sell a lot to make your nut. You sell one a week, that's 10000 That's $120,000 a year, you're fine. Like that's a decent living, right? But I try to do that at a low margin and you're going to work your, you'll work yourself into a grave and still not leave anything behind. That's a true story. <laughs> yeah. So with the, with pricing strategy, it's just figure out who you want to be. We talked about this. We alluded to it when I talked about inertia. It's like, I'm going down this road because that, that's the road I'm on. So that's fair for I'm going down this road and I'll just press the accelerator. That's well, not really the right, <clears throat> maybe it's not the best strategy for life or for business, but if you're in business, don't just go, I'm going to clean carpets and I'm going to, uh, therefore I'm cleaning carpets and I'm a carpet cleaner. So would you like your carpets clean? You go, we're going to specialize in the type of carpet cleaning that, you know, that nobody else does. We, we love, you know, pet odors and stains, or we love, you know, like, like pick your niche and this is what you're going to focus on. You're going to be the best in the world at that, but you're going to charge for it. And you're going to do the things that other companies don't do. Now, how, how simple is this, Keith? We go, what do other companies not do that you can do that costs you zero dollars and it sets you apart? You can answer your phone when somebody calls, make sure they get a live answer because if somebody's calling, they want to know. If you've got chat on your website, respond to the chat in a very short time frame. If you, you know, like if you say we'll be there at eight o'clock, what time should you be there? Eight. Like eight o'clock, maybe 10 till eight. You're like you want to be, you want to do what you said and a little bit more. It's like, but here's the norm. Um, I work with a lot of contractors and they love us. I've got my flooring company shirt on today. They love us because we say, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to be there at this time. And then holy shit, we just show up at that time. And we send them a text 10 minutes out to go, Hey, we're going to be there at this time. And they, they're like, that's an, that's enough to stand out. And you go, why does it's free? It's freaking free. Right. Anyway. You can provide a higher level of service and charge a lot more. And if, if you've got enough uh, business, you've got enough lead flow coming in to actually measure this stuff. If you go, if your closing ratio is 80% or higher, you are not charging nearly enough. You could probably double your price. And if that made you nervous that you need to really consider this deeply, like you could raise your price significantly 
a good metric, if you have decent lead flow, like consistent leads coming in where you're getting enough business for your company, raise your prices until your closing rate drops to 50%. What you'll find if you do the math is you will close fewer jobs at a higher price and you will 50% to double your profit margin. Your profits mm -hmm. would, you do less work and make twice as much on the bottom line. Is I, you know, you and I, we met at the huge convention like six years ago and it's very common when you're in a convention setting, people are, people are dick measuring. They're like, we get a $500,000 this year. We did a million dollars this year. We get a $2 million business. And we like, that's all cool. I understand it takes something to manage that and to get there. That's admirable. But how much was your net profit in the bank after everything else is paid? If you made a million dollars revenue and you have a net profit of like 20 grand, that's foolish. But if you get a net profit of 200 grand, 300 grand, now we're moving in the right direction. So net is far more important than top line revenue. And if you got, you know, if if you're operating by yourself and you're like looking at like I want a million dollar company in in a in a moderate temperate climate, a one a solo operator can net 150 grand a year just working by themselves. Like you don't need a million dollar company. Now, you're going to be busy. You're going to be working a lot. But still, that's damn that's good. Like you could do that for three or four years, live modestly, and then if if this is not your path, you're like you just gave yourself a you know like a, a nest egg to start with, and you can start going. You can do something else. You go learn to play guitar and travel through Europe playing guitar, in the and you know playing on the streets to get your practice in where nobody knows you, and then come back and start doing shows. I mean, you, whatever. I I use guitar as the example because I started I started learning guitar three weeks ago because I always wanted to play. And it was just too damn busy. <laughs> I just happened to have a guitar Cheerio. next to me. <laughs> Sweet. Sorry. <laughs> I'm ADD. That's why they love me. Nice. Nice. I love it. Is that is that uh, the sticker on there? Elk or deer? It's uh, I think it's an elk or something. I don't know. I got, I was, I was looking for a guitar off. I'm like, I'll go on Facebook Marketplace and get one used. A bunch of them popped up. Up there was one in the neighborhood over. Oh, sweet. They're like, we'll leave it on the porch and leave money underneath the mat. And I think I got this for like, I don't know, sixty bucks or something. I don't know. Oh heck yeah! Sorry, I was gonna play Metallica for a second. I I can play like almost nothing. Yeah. So never mind. <laughs> All right, man. So, nice. okay, awesome. Keith, I've I've done all the talking. You you asked a question that set me off, and you can tell what I'm interested in. But um, yeah, I, I'm going to slow down a little bit. I I just feel like I just can just listen because you've been through this so many times and you've coached so many people. I don't really have to say anything because as you speak, you're hyper aware of what you're saying or how you're being perceived and you you're aware of all the objections and questions that would come based off what you're saying because you've been through this and you've conversated with so many people and you've done public speaking and coaching and all this this is like what you do that i don't really have to say much of anything because if i just wait an extra four seconds you will you would you, you're automatically answering the next questions that somebody would ask so i can just smile and take notes Okay. Sweet. I'll ask one question. That's cool. Yeah. How me. does somebody know how to accurately, if they're testing their closing rates and conversion rates and their sales and raising their prices, when the fear comes up, how can they rely off their gauges or what type of math or metrics, how can they track this stuff so they can actually put it into practice and know when to hold and when to fold and like, Where's the, where's the boundaries and limits to this? All right, now I'm going to run on that. So if you operate on your own, you probably have a really good gut sense of where you are anyway. But they, the the um, stats will beat your gut sense every time. 
Like you really need to know what they are. So it's easy to measure. You go, how many phone calls did we get? Did we get or requests for estimates? How many estimates did we give? So that's your initial conversion rate. So lead, like inquiry to real lead. Because you know sometimes, like if a hundred people ask you for a quote. You may try to contact them back to say, yeah, what's your address? And you never reach them. So whatever you get a hundred requests, you end up doing, you know, 80 quotes. So I got 80 quotes out there. And then how many of those turn into a job? And you probably, it's not wise to track it like over the course of a year. Cause some people have, you know, really good follow-up automations built in, but if you don't just go like in a month, we got X number of calls. We booked X number of jobs. What's the ratio? We got a hundred calls. We booked 50 jobs. You have a 50% closing ratio. Or if you like, whether you give, you know, estimates over the phone or you give them in person or they're just done online, it doesn't really matter. You just go, how many people requested a bid? How many bids do we give? How many jobs said, yes, here's, take my money. That's what you're looking for. So that's your ratio. And you, you figure it out. If you're like, if you're a solo operator and you're like, you're really hustling and you're going in person, you're probably at an 80% close ratio or more. Like I remember one year I was so, I just, I bragged. I to myself because I was like, my closing ratio on site was 96%. Period. Oh, I'm dead. I can't believe I have such crap internet. Are we back? Can you hear me, Keith? Yeah, I can hear Is you. Is that bomb? It just cut out for a second. But Tell yeah. me when we're connected. I can hear you clear. You're just, your face is frozen. Okay, cool. Yeah. my. It, I'm in Montana. My face is frozen. Hopefully this will pick back up. Yeah, I can see you I don't now. Know where we are. Give a thumbs up when you can hear me. Thumbs up. I right, cut out. Well, I'll talk for a second then. I don't know. Yeah, in my landscape business, um, last year there was a very difficult point where out of every 100 phone calls, we only booked 16 quotes. So that's qualified leads and only closed two jobs out of every 100 phone calls. And I was pulling my hair, pulling my hair out. And I realized that I had raised the prices too dramatically too fast. And I also had a shitty attitude, but I didn't see that I was blind to it. I had this attitude that I was carrying around that I was just burned out and sick of meeting with so many customers and running my landscape business. And it took me like, so I lowered the prices down a little bit cleaned up my attitude, not that I wasn't being mean or anything. It was just an overall energy that I was just burned out. And I was like, what's going on here? So six months later, I look back and I go, oh my God, when I'm in a place of gratitude and I'm happy to see the customers and I'm in a, I have a heart of service, the close rate goes up. So that's the one thing that you're not you know, quantifying if you're tracking everything is you being the person who's actually having a heart of service and having fun on the quotes and, and being super cool and transparent with the customers. It's just like, and me, what I was doing, I was guarded because I know that no matter how bad of a day you're having, it's never, ever fair to a customer to be mean or rude or anything like that. It's not their fault you're having a bad day. They just want to quote for service. So what I would do is I would be guarded. I'd have a guard up when I would meet with customers and my close rate was going down because I was going through a tough time. And I was like, man, is that the time when you, when you should hire somebody to do sales for you? Because you're not going to be super, super happy, go lucky all the time. Right. So that's when I had a, um, a receptionist sell as many jobs over the phone as possible. And we've established minimums. Like we have a $700 minimum for anything landscaping and a $500 minimum for going in the house window cleaning. And um, I've cut back a lot and I let go of a lot of clients and gotten more uh, focused. So it looks like Sid is gone here, but that's okay. Cause we're at the top of the hour. My friend's and now is a perfect time. I just want to say real quick, I'll do a commercial spot real quick. Uh, if you're looking for a software to run your service business on, I've been using Jobber software to run my business for four years now. I love it. I literally can imagine running my business without it. And it tracks all the things that we're talking about. Uh, my favorite feature inside of Jobber is actually the automated booking and scheduling. So if you get off the phone with a customer and you collect all their information directly inside of Jobber, you can book a quote and it'll send them automatic booking confirmation. It's very professional looking to it. It makes you be perceived as a high level service provider. 
because they get it. And then you can also uh, click one button and it automatically texts it to their phone as well, where it opens a link. Boom. Now it says your your, uh, your booking is confirmed with so-and-so landscaping at this time, right? And then you can give them a heads up text or email when you're on your way. I just call the customer 30 minute heads up text. And then if there's a change order on the job, they want more work done. You could do it directly inside a jobber and it automatically communicates and follows up with the customer. It takes a lot of work off you. It's like almost like AI, like automation. And so I love it. Go to getjobber.com slash Kelfis, getjobber.com slash Kelfis, my last name, K-A-L-F-A-S to get a free two week trial and you get, a huge discount if you sign up with my exclusive link, getjobber.com slash Kelfis. So my friends, uh, I hope you enjoyed this show today on the Untrapped podcast. we got a lot of great shows coming out. We're doing two shows a week on Monday and on Thursday, twice a week now. So look out if you're on my email list at keithkelfis.com or go to Apple or Spotify to listen to the Untrapped podcast and your headphones or earbuds while you're out working or driving. Uh, I think we just crossed, I don't know, 650,000 downloads. Uh, super excited about that. And if uh, you'd like to reach out to be a guest on the Untrapped Podcast, send me an email, untrappedpodcast at gmail.com. And thanks for hanging out, guys. We'll see you in the next show.